Slideshow. We have slideshow better than for you. Oh shoot. <laughs> How do I escape? Where's your where's your escape key? Did you just close that? No, I guess. The restaurant. Okay. Oh, and can you start the recording on the camera? Can everybody hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. I don't think this is working. <laughs> okay. I guess we'll get started. So welcome to the Deep Learning Decal. Um, hope you guys have all had a first, good first few weeks of classes. Um, so today we're going to uh, go over uh, just some course logistics quickly first, and then so a brief background on machine learning. Hopefully you've all sort of seen it before and know what's going on. Oh, I'm James, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, this is Quinn. This is Jordan. Uh, there's a few other instructors who aren't here today. Um, I'll show you the instructors in a second. Um, and before I get to that, just running through the overview again. Uh, brief background on machine learning. Uh, get into the main topic about uh, deep feed forward networks, how to optimize them, and regularization. Um, yeah, so starting off with course logistics. Uh, the instructors are myself, Jordan, uh, Quinn, Michael Zhang, who's not here today, and Neil Kent, who's not here today. Um, yeah, feel free to ask us any questions, um, relevant questions are fine too. Um, so as you know, classes right now, Wednesdays, 5 to 7, first half of class is a lecture, second half is a reading group. Uh, the class is loosely based off of the Deep Learning book by Ian Goodfellow. Uh, there, it's freely available at deeplearningbook.org. Uh, we're basically going to go through all of chapters 6 through 20. Uh, so pretty ambitious, we have a lot to go through, but uh, we'll get there. Um, so in terms of grading, uh, it's 40% attendance base uh, and 60% the other option. And you get an option between doing a project and taking the reading group option. Uh, basically the, the reading group option you will uh, read the papers each week uh, and submit questions each week about the papers and then lead one reading group over the course of the semester. And then for the project option, you will work on a project over the course of the entire semester and there are different milestones that you have to reach for this project. Uh, do you want to go through project over now? Or? Sure. Um, it's okay, I'll take it. So yeah, as you know, the two options for your main portion of the grade are to do a project or the reading group option. And just to reiterate on what James said, uh, the reading group option entails reading the paper, submitting three good questions. We will we'll be reading the questions and then uh, having to stand up here and um, prepare a presentation about the paper and field any questions for the last hour. Um, the other option is to complete a project. So um, I just. I'm going to go through this project description and then hopefully by the end of the class today you'll have an idea of which option you'd like to do. So the yeah, the project is meant for you to kind of pick an area of deep learning that you're really excited about and go out and do some explorations, um, do some experiments, do some literature review on your own and put together um, a report that you're, I guess, proud to put together. Um, 
So yeah, you should be proud of anything you put your name on. So the first step is to find teams. So uh, just real quick, I know this is super cheesy, but just turn to your neighbor and introduce yourself and just so you can know at least one person in the class. Or you turn both ways too. I <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm glad you all got to know each other. You're so friendly. <laughs> no, I don't. All right, guys, let's get back to talking about the project. So you have a kind of a lot of different options for what your pro for what you want your project to be. Um, one option, which is kind of maybe. Not the easiest, it could be the most work, but it's th finding the ideas is in itself easy. Just do a literature review over a particular topic. So that involves um, reading a bunch of papers, figuring out what's, what's the state of the art, and um, basically giving a critical lit literature review of what's out there and what can be better and what's being worked on and what's going to come. Another option is to implement existing methods. So find a paper that you think is really cool, find a really cool data set that either has been or hasn't been attacked yet, and try and implement that method on that data set and talk about your results and of course you should be comparing to previous results and um, talking about future work and there's a lot of stuff entailed in the project um, but we'll talk we'll get on to that later and there's, there's other options too right um, so if you have any other things that you think would be a cool project for the class you're more than welcome to um, talk to us about it and we can um, have a discussion about whether that would be a good idea or not um, but hopefully you, um, so we've given you a few weeks to so until when you have to submit the proposal. So hopefully by then you can, you can have a better idea of what kind of project you want to do and who you want to work with. Um, but these are just some possible topics. Um, you, don't have to, you can pick something from this list. You definitely don't have to. Um, these are just some ideas to get, your, to get the blood spinning. So yeah, there's just a lot of uh, cool things that I thought were cool that would be a um, fun project to work on. And we forgot to put the last bullet point here, but uh, it's, we'll update it. So. Um, we also give you a list of useful resources, and the useful resources contain also a lot of uh, cool ideas for projects, as well as uh, just kind of cool ideas for deep learning in general. And then we hope to give you some extra resources about how to write a good paper, um, especially in the context of NIPS. So the project in the reading group, we hope, will be just about the same work. So a reading group entails reading a paper every week, submitting three questions, as well as leading a group and so we anticipate that uh, actually I think maybe the project might be a little bit more work depending on your motivation um, but let's talk about the deliverables so there are actually, there's actually five deliverables for the project um, the first one is the proposal which is due on week six and the proposal should contain this information the statement of the problem and its background some discussion of related work um, your um, chosen data set that you'll use um, how you'll implement the method the tools you use and then finally um, a way that you know you'll be able to evaluate your metric. Your, your, sorry, evaluate your results. Um, you need some sort of some sort of metric that you're trying to um, uh, either beat or match or um, evaluate. Second uh, submission is just uh, two weeks later. You have to kind of give us. So it's a very condensed course. If you haven't got that, we meet once a week for 12 or 13 weeks. So we kind of have to. Um, hit the ball moving pretty quick once we get going. So uh, after two weeks after you submit your proposal, you have to turn in uh, interim submission one, which is basically just a progress report about what you've done, what you are going to do next. Just not not too complicated. Just something to keep you honest about the the track that you're taking. Uh, second interim is a couple weeks later, and then by then we expect you to have some kind of results and figures. And finally, uh, three weeks after that, the final report will be due, and that's our last day of class, November 29th. Um, and during, so the report's due at night on, on that night, on that day, but during class, you'll have to give a little five-minute elevator pitch style presentation 
about your project, about your results, um, just so everyone can see what everyone's been working on. And also, uh, good communication skills are super important in this field. So it's really important to be able to summarize your results and explain them clearly. Um, so right now, I'll be happy to field any questions about the reading group or project. And um, yeah, um, you don't have to choose right now. Hopefully, by the end of the class, we'll be sending out a link that will give us your final option. Um, but yeah, question right there. Yeah. Yeah. So that was just for us to gauge like what kind of levels we have of interest in either option. Uh, but you don't have to commit to what you said. Uh, I have no code in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I do think there's a strong benefit of doing the reading group option. Um, I, I think sometimes if, I think even doing the reading group option will help you learn a lot more about different things. If you do the project, you're kind of focusing all your energy on one particular research topic. Um, so I think there's a lot of merit in doing the reading group. But yeah, that's, that's an issue. But I, I hope that some of you will choose the reading group option. It's definitely um, um, very interesting. Yeah. I assume you can still like the handle the reading group are not doing that option, right? Not only that, but you're required to. So if, if, even if you do the project option, you're still expected to attend to the reading group and it's still encouraged to read the papers, encouraged to submit questions if you don't have to, um, but you're definitely encouraged to keep up with the reading group. Um, that said, you are required to be here as part of your attendance grade. Um, it's two hours a week, folks. You just have to keep you guys honest. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, any other questions? Cool. So, James, are you ready to... Get your hands dirty, some deep networks. Thanks, Jordan. Um, yeah, so just before I get started again, I will say that like as instructors, uh, we think that the reading group option will be more beneficial to your learning than the project option, but we give you both options so you can choose. Um, yeah, so moving on. Uh, I'd like to just give a brief sort of hand wavy introduction to machine learning for those. Hopefully, everybody's this is review for everybody, but uh, I'll just run through it quickly, anyways. Um, so, what are the sorts of problems that machine learning tries to solve? We generally split them into three categories supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and semi supervised or active learning. Supervised learning is things like image classification and uh, like sentiment analysis and things like this where you're given, uh, given data and labels for that data, and then you're trying to learn a map from the data to the labels such that if you're given new data, you can come up with the label for it. Whereas unsupervised learning, you're not given these original labels. You're just given a bunch of data, and you try to learn patterns and take insight from this data that you have, even though you don't have labels for it. And then semi-supervised learning, as the name implies, is in between, where you have Typically, the setting is that you have a bunch of unlabeled data and some process by, through which you can label the data. Um, but this process is expensive. As an example, uh, if you're trying to work out what chemicals bind to a certain substance, your unlabeled data is the set of all possible chemical formulas. And your labels for this data are whether or not they bind to a particular substance. And then your labeling procedure is a chemical experiment of trying to see whether this particular molecule binds to that substance. And that chemical experiment is really expensive, so you want to minimize how often you run that experiment. So that's the sort of goal of active learning is to uh, minimize the number of labels that you need. So for this lecture, we're going to focus mostly on supervised learning, because uh, that's where feed-forward networks uh, really excel. Um, so here are some examples of supervised learning. In the top left, it's uh, image classification uh, on a data set called ImageNet, where you're given an image and you're trying to classify what's in that image. Like, for example, uh, cherries or a leopard or a container ship. Um, and as you can see, it does a reasonable job at this. And the state of the art is actually very good in this area. Um, another example is speech recognition where you're given an audio waveform and you're trying to work out what the words uh, that are being said are. Uh, another example is sentiment analysis, where you take in sentences and you try to analyze them, oh, sorry, try to label them as 
positive or negative or other things like other sentiments like angry, sad, things like that. Or uh, another example, human action recognition, where you're given a video and you're trying to work out what the people in the video are doing. Uh, this is a really interesting problem, in my opinion. Um, so just to formal formalize the goal of supervised learning really quick, uh, I said this before, but it's to take some data X and labels for that data Y and find a map from X to Y um, such that if you're given a new set of data X prime, you can come up with new labels Y prime accurately such that they reflect the same uh, distribution that you were given originally. So to get into like the meat of the lecture, we're going to talk about deep feed forward networks now. Um, hopefully you've all like are somewhat familiar with the ideas behind neural networks. Um, I'll briefly run through a little introduction at the start uh, just in case, but um, we'll get into some more advanced stuff in a bit. Um, so, so why neural networks? Why did people come up with these things? Well, they're actually based on how our brain works, or at least how we think our brain works, in that our brain is composed of a bunch of neurons, and the electrical firings between these neurons uh, affect how we think and how we do tasks and things like that. So um, neuroscientists believe that uh, dopamine is uh, the brain's sort of reward signal. So dopamine is a chemical that flows through the brain um, and neuroscientists believe that uh, based on these dopamine signals our brain changes its connections in order to learn how to do things. Um, this is like very rough science um, people aren't really sure what's going on in the brain yet. Uh, it's still being developed as a theory. Um, but you could think of this sort of reward signal as very much similar to like a gradient update in a neural network. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about there, I will get to that in a second. But yeah, so there are big parallels between neural networks and how the brain works. So what does a neuron in an artificial neural network actually look like? Well, it's it's just a it it's just a unit that takes in input and takes in many inputs and puts out one output and it it from these inputs it weights each input and then sums across the product of these weights in the input and then runs that through some sort of activation function which I'll talk about next slide but uh, ignoring the activation function for now you can think of it as a linear combination of its inputs where it's trying to learn the weights of that linear combination. Um, yeah, so when, you, when you're learning, you're actually learning these values of W here. Um, so what is this activation function and why do we need it? So if you were to just have this linear combination of your inputs, you would essentially your neural network would just be a piecewise linear function. Um, a complicated one, but that's not good enough to like, approximate uh, real natural functions. So we need some sort of nonlinearity in our networks. And we can achieve this by applying a nonlinear function to the output of these linear combinations at each step. So there's various examples of these kind of nonlinear uh, activation functions. Th these are sort of the four typical ones you would see. Um, and there's variations on each of these. But you have uh, in blue here is sigmoid, which is sort of the canonical activation function that you would have seen in 189 or such courses. And then there's uh, tan h, which is like a familiar hyperbolic tangent function, uh, and then the soft plus in light blue here, and the ReLU, or rectified linear unit, in red. Um, there, there are very differences between them, but uh, for all practical purposes, they're essentially a hyperparameter. Um, so, why, so like, we have, so now we have built up this network where we, we have some sort of nonlinear function of the inputs. It goes through each of these neurons. It gets uh, applied to this activation function. So you get some nonlinear output. Um, but why, why can we learn things with this structure? Why does it work? Well, there's a theorem that says that any function, like any function at all, uh, any mapping from one finite space to another finite space, can be arbitrarily approximated by a one layer, one hidden layer neural network. Um, yeah, at first it seems very simple, but if you think about it, this is actually an incredibly powerful theorem, um, an incredibly powerful result. This means that 
literally any mapping can be approximated to an arbitrary degree of precision by a neural network with just one hidden layer. Although it doesn't bound the size of this hidden layer, so this hidden layer could get larger and larger and larger. Um, so for practical purposes, this might not be good enough. And that goes into my next thing that you should have thought of when you see this theorem is, if this is true, why do we need deep neural networks? Well, there's sort of two things here. First, as I mentioned, this, the number of neurons in this one hidden layer can grow, like, it grows very quickly with the, the like, complexity of the task you're trying to achieve, a function you're trying to model. Um, as just a, an example, imagine you want to model the function uh, that maps every atom in the universe to a unique identifier. You come up with a unique identifier for each atom in the universe, and you want to learn that mapping. Well, obviously, you're going to need a degree of freedom for each at atom in the universe to learn this mapping. So uh, that, that's already like an unthinkably large uh, hidden layer. So, but maybe you're thinking like, okay, but I don't really want to learn that mapping. I want to learn something practical like a mapping from images to labels. But uh, even in this case, people have shown that deep neural networks uh, do better than shallow ones in terms of generalization or test error. So uh, deep neural networks are able to better uh, generalize to inputs they have not seen. Um, you can see this in this plot here where it shows test accuracy versus depth of the network. So you can see it's a very monotonic function. I mean, there's diminishing returns as you get deeper and deeper, but you can see that deeper networks do do better. So now we know that deep neural networks can model these functions, but uh, we have to make decisions about what types of networks we use and like what architectures we use for these networks. So obvious questions to ask are like, when do we want to use a deep network versus a shallow network versus a wide network or a narrow network? By wide, I mean uh, lots of neurons in one layer and narrow the opposite. Um, and you can see, uh, Couple this picture didn't show up very well, but a couple different network structures here. Uh, this top one's called an autoencoder, where you start off big, go to a small, like coding, it's called, or like compressed version of the uh, compressed representation of the input, and then decode that to an uh, uncompressed version here. This sort of thing is good when, uh, when you want to sort of learn this minimal representation of the, your input distribution, uh, and then you have like these deeper ones here, like you can't even read that, I'm sure, but it says ResNet. Uh, this actually, ResNet, I think, won uh, the ImageNet competition in, I want to say, 2016. So it achieved state-of-the-art results in image classification. So it's really uh, hard to say exactly when you want to use a deep network versus a wide and narrow one. It's more of sort of like a, like a try and see which one works. But in general, uh, you, uh, the trend is that uh, on a lot of tasks, deep networks are getting better and better at things. So, like the deep, the if you look at like a plot of time versus like depth of the winning network on the ImageNet competition, it will probably look something, uh, probably something like this, like almost exponential. Um, the the issue is, uh, when we get these really deep networks, we run into problems like uh, vanishing gradients and things like this, which uh, I'm sure we'll discuss when we talk about RNNs. Um, so moving on, uh, this image I put in just because uh, I think it's a really cool image. It shows a bunch of different uh, neural network architectures. Uh, it doesn't show up here very well, but yeah, look up uh, uh, like I think if you looked up like chart of neural networks on Google, you'd Network come up. Zoo. Network Zoo, that's what I was looking for. Um, yeah, so this shows you like all the different, um, pretty much all the different network structures from like just this basic feed forward all the way to like a DC GAN sort of thing. Um, we'll talk about GANs probably second last lecture. So, um, so that's a basic rundown of uh, deep feed forward neural <coughs> networks. Um, and now I want to move on to like how to actually train these things and how to get them to learn these functions that we're trying to get them to model. So this is the optimization section. So 
there are basically three steps to trying to uh, quote unquote teach a neural network something. First, you actually have to know what you want the neural network to learn. You have to define this. So, I mean, this step is as simple as saying, I want to uh, learn how to classify images or things like that. Once you know what you want the network to do, you have to quantify this objective into some sort of uh, mathematical formulation that the network can understand. Um, we typically do this by writing loss functions that represent uh, sort of cost of, or like the how well a network is doing. And then finally, we have to actually optimize the network to uh, either minimize this cost or optimize its utility function. Um, so I'll go into, uh, so basically I'm going to assume that you know what you want to do. Because if you don't know what you want to do, well, what are you going to do? You just need to know what you want to do. Um, so once you know what you actu actually are aiming to do, then you can, uh, then we need to know how to quantify the objective and optimize it. But, uh, so I'll go through these two steps, which uh, I'm going to say we don't know how to do yet. Um, so start off talking about a little bit about loss functions. So loss functions are how you represent your objective quantitatively. Um, essentially, a loss function uh, encodes uh, how wrong a network is about its predictions. So uh, I put a few requirements on the left here for loss functions. Essentially, a loss function has to obviously encapsulate what you want the network to actually do. Uh, it has to be differentiable because of the way that we train networks, and it has to be easy to compute or relatively easy to compute. Um, quickly run through a few examples of loss functions. Uh, so there's mean squared error, which is used for regression tasks where you're trying to learn uh, sort of a continuous output, uh, which I'll, I'll run through mean squared error on the next slide. And then there's cross entropy for classification tasks where you're trying to classify things as, oh, you know, this, this image is a cat, this is an image is a dog. And uh, this cross entropy loss function works well for those sort of tasks. And then there's a few other loss functions that you see in more sort of shallow learning contexts, like uh, SVMs and logistic regression, that sort of thing that you've seen in 189 and that sort of stuff. Um, so I won't talk about those very much, but you know, there's zero one loss, hinge loss, logistic loss. If you're interested, you can look them up. Um, yeah. So mean squared error is very simple. You just take the mean across your entire training set of uh, the squared difference between uh, the label that uh, the, the label that the data was actually labeled as and what your network predicted it to be. So you're, uh, this image sort of illustrates it. You're looking at uh, if these uh, points are the actual data and this line is the line that was fit by your model, you're looking at the square of this difference between each of the points and the line. Um, and then you take the mean of that. Um, this is pretty a pretty standard metric for regression tasks. Uh, for classification tasks, this metric doesn't or this loss function doesn't work as well. So we use something called cross entropy. Um, the basic idea here is that when you when you do a classification task with a neural network, your output layer is usually a probability distribution across the the label the classes that you want to classify. So if you say have ten classes you'll output a 10 vector, 10 length vector, um, and each value in that vector will be between 0 and 1, and it will represent how confident you are that it is, it is that class. And then when you're actually doing prediction, you would take the argmax across this vector, i.e. you would take whichever is the largest one, you would say it's that class. Um, so this sort of uh, output uh, lends itself to uh, doing a loss function based on sort of the divergence of this probability distribution from the actual or true probability distribution across these uh, the actual data. Um, so another way of saying that is that the cross entropy is the negative log likelihood of the of your predicted probability distribution under the real prob probability distribution. Um, that is to say, it's how it's the log of how likely. Um, your prediction is given the actual distribution. Um, so this equation here is essentially you're taking the uh, average across all of your training examples 
And then for each training example, you want to sum across each of the classes. Here, m, little m, is uh, how many classes you have. So you take the sum across these, and then for each training example and each class in that training example, you want to compare the value of that uh, class in that training example in the training set, so that's a 0 or a 1. Essentially, uh, in the training set you'll have this 10 length vector and uh, 9 of them will be zeros and one of them will be a 1, for representing that it's that class where that 1 is. The index of that 1 represents that class. I said that really confusingly, but um, yeah, so, so, you, so these y, i, j's here are either 0 or 1. Uh, representing whether or not that training example is that class or is not that class. Um, and then you take that times the log of uh, your prediction. So this prediction is actually between, is from 0 to 1, so it's a continuous value between 0 and 1, which is the output of your neural network at index j. So, yeah. Um, and just like a quick fun fact, this is equivalent to minimizing the KL divergence between uh, your predicted probability distribution and the actual one. Yeah, question? Yeah, I have a question about that. Again. So you said like, um, you know, at the end you have like a 10 length vector, you know, it would be like 1, 1 in one position, probably 2, 0. But then in that equation, like let's say I'm looking at yj, it's actually a 0. Like, wouldn't that just be like 0, 10, or something? Yeah, that would just, that, so wherever it's a 0, you don't consider that part. So you're, so you're basically saying, like, I don't care about what I predicted for the classes that it's not. I just care about what I predicted for the class that it is. I see. So like, let's say that, you know, that class you predicted is has, uh, you said it has like a forty-two percent chance. Yeah. Then you 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 get log forty point four two. Yeah. And the whole thing has a negative sign in front of it. So then the higher um, the higher no so the higher the the higher your y i j hat value the closer you get to zero the log of that is closer to zero so the whole thing goes closer to zero because the log log is like this <coughs> And you're you're always below one. Um, any other questions about anything that I've talked about? Um, yeah. So that was a sort of brief overview of uh, the two like canonical loss functions for deep neural networks. Um, so at this point, I say you know how to quantify the objective. Now we want to move on to, based on that, based on that loss function, how do we optimize so that we minimize the loss that we incur? So the standard way of doing this in neural networks is gradient descent. Um, hopefully you've seen gradient descent in 189 or something prior, but I'll briefly run through the idea. So you have some loss function j, maybe mean squared error or cross entropy. And you essentially want to find the global minimum of this loss function. So the way that we do this is we update, uh, update our weights in our neural network with respect to the gradient of this loss function. So essentially, you can see an illustration here. Um, but essentially, we start with some initial weights in, um, in, this, in this plot. Our, uh, the, the weights of our neural network are on the x-axis, and the value of the loss function is on the y-axis. So we start with some initial weight, and then we basically want to descend this uh, function by uh, subtracting the gradient from our weights each time. So you can see that representing the equation there, uh, where you, you subtract the gradient with respect to the weights of the loss function. Uh, and then there's a eta parameter there, it's called a learning rate, which is a hyperparameter that you set, <coughs> and it controls how quickly that you go down this function. Uh, there's some issues around setting that. Um, we have an optimization lecture where we'll probably cover that in more depth. Um, so there are various variants on gradient descent, um, but it's generally not computationally feasible to calculate this gradient across our entire training set. So what we typically do is something called stochastic gradient descent, uh, 
where we randomly sample some subset of our training set and we update uh, in this sort of batch way where we take this random sample, update based on that batch, and then take another random sample, update on that batch, and so on and so forth until we converge to something that we like. On the previous slide, um, you said we would discuss how to optimize the data. I mean, so, so what I meant to say was uh, we're going to discuss optimizers in more deep detail in a later lecture, but so gradient descent being one optimizer. So the learning rate uh, is one hyperparameter of an optimizer, uh, and how you go about like changing that is is one issue. So for example, if your learning rate is too too large, you can imagine sort of skipping around in this. Are we going to talk about convergence? Um, I am not teaching that particular lecture, so I'm not sure, but probably. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so as I was saying, we have this stochastic gradient descent where we sample, uh, instead of calculating gradient across our whole training set, we just take samples and do this sort of batch thing. And uh, that's basically how you would see anybody do it in uh, real life. Nobody would ever calculate it across the whole training set. Um, so one question you might have at this point is, how do we actually compute this gradient? Because we have this complicated neural network and we have to compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to the weights of this network. And that seems like a hard thing to do. So hopefully you've heard of it before, but the algorithm to do this is backpropagation. Uh, if you've never heard of backpropagation, there's a really nice tutorial on the MLab blog uh, here. If you don't want to copy down the URL, if you go to ml.berkeley.eu and then click read the blog, you'll find it there too. Um, but the basic idea behind it is to take your uh, sort of errors at the end. The, so the gradients um, of the output are conditional on like all of the weights throughout the whole network. And you can use chain rule to sort of back propagate these gradients between the layers. Um, so I'm not going to discuss it in detail right now because of time constraints. But yeah, if you don't know about back propagation, definitely look that up because it's a uh, pretty important Algorithm. Um, but I'm going to go into sort of generalized backpropagation in sort of computational graphs. So instead of, instead of considering just a neural network, we can consider an arbitrary computational graph uh, where the nodes of this graph are um, operations and the edges are sort of how the data flows through the graph. So if I go back to this slide, the sort of what we want to do is we want to take any two arbitrary elements of this graph and be able to compute the derivative of one element with respect to the other. Um, and so as I was saying, the nodes are the operations and the edges, the incoming edges are the input to that operation, the outcoming, outgoing edges are the outputs of that operation. Um, and here you see an example of a computational graph where you have operations like multiply plus uh, a sigmoid activation function here. Um, and then uh, like a, a greater than here, so the output of this is actually a Boolean value. So computational graphs are very general in that the data flowing through it can be sort of any, any typical values you'd see in a computer program, like Booleans or floats or integers or things like that. So talking about it in terms of computational graphs is very general um, and can sort of represent things beyond neural networks and into more complicated sort of graphical models. Um, so there are basically three ways to compute a derivative um, on a computer. Uh, one is to just numerically compute it with things like finite differences and other algorithms like that. Another way is to use like the rules of differentiation and go through using the symbols and actually like create an algorithm that does differentiation just like we do, following our rules with symbols and things like that. But the coolest way to do it is auto-differentiation, where we actually go through and define a new system of numbers, uh, that where we append to each number the, the sort of derivative component. And then uh, we define a new arithmetic on these numbers. And then based on that arithmetic, you can automatically compute derivatives just by feeding uh, 
feeding forward through a function. Uh, I'll talk more in detail just now, so don't worry if that didn't make sense. Um, but the basic idea, oh, sorry, the um, auto differenti differentiation is nice because it's pretty computationally quick, but it's also exact. So numerical metho methods are very, very fast, but they're not exact, and you don't get a sort of symbolic output to it. Um, but uh, symbolic differentiation and auto diff both are um, exact methods. You compute the exact derivative rather than a numerical approximation. But auto diff is much faster than symbolic differentiation. So how do we do this? We define a new number system uh, called dual numbers, where you append uh, this sort of derivative term to each number. So you define a new set of numbers. Uh, I have them bolded here, which is just a pair of numbers. One is a number, and the other is a derivative term. Um, and then once we have this new set of numbers, we have to go back and redefine how addition, multiplication, and division, and all these sort of things work. So we can do that, and you can see that addition is uh, defined uh, how you would, just like component-wise. Uh, so x plus y and x dot plus y dot, pretty straightforward. And then multiplication looks uh, weird, and like you would be... You might look at it and say, why is it like that? But I'll come to that in a second. But essentially, you have x, y dot plus x dot y as your new uh, derivative component. And then uh, division, uh, this is like, well, I guess inversion here, but just negative x dot over x squared. Um, so you might notice that this looks very familiar from calculus. So if you were to actually take the derivative of x times y with respect to, so if, if each of these x and y were a variable uh, like a function with respect to some variable say t and then you were to take the derivative of x times y with respect to t uh, you, your result would be x times y dot plus x dot times y so in this way this arithmetic sort of calculates derivatives for you um, so just to go through a concrete example, uh, let's say we have a function x squared y, and we want to compute the derivative with respect to x. We can do this uh, simply with these uh, quote-unquote dual numbers. So we have to initialize x dot and y dot somehow. So we take the derivative of ourselves there, but you can, you can imagine these, are, these initializations are always going to be 0 or 1 if you just have a single variable here. Um, so since it's with respect to x, x derivative is 1 and y is 0. Um, and then we can go through and do these multiplications. And, uh, so you find that uh, x squared is x squared 2x. And then x squared times y ends up being x squared y 2xy. And so in this way, we just found the derivative of x squared y without, uh, without really using the rules of calculus. Um, bypassing it in exchange for this new arithmetic we created. So this is really cool. Um, this relates to computational graphs because you can actually do the same thing to calculate an arbitrary derivative in a computational graph um, instead of uh, doing it in this like sort of column format like you see in math equations. You just think of passing these sort of dual numbers between uh, nodes in your computational graph, and then those operations. Each operation gets to define like how what it does to the first component of the dual number and what it does to the derivative component of the dual number. So if you have an operation like addition, then it defines these rules here. Multiplication defines these rules here. But you can imagine having an arbitrary operation like sine of x, where you define uh, a new operation. So the result here would be if you had like sine of x x dot, it would result in uh, sine of x and cosine of x dot, oh, wait, no, sorry, sine of x and cosine of x uh, would be your result. Sorry, that's not correct. x, x dot sine of x, yeah. Um, so this auto differentiation is actually how TensorFlow works. If you've ever used TensorFlow, which is a framework for uh, it's actually a framework for comp using uh, computation on computational graphs, but most people use it for neural networks. Um, but yeah, this auto diff stuff is how TensorFlow works. <laughs>
question? Um, so most likely, if you take the project option, you'll use TensorFlow in your project. Um, if you do use TensorFlow, we can help you better than if you don't use TensorFlow in your project. Um, but we won't have any like assignments or anything like that in TensorFlow. Any other questions? Okay. So now we have a basic idea of how we can actually optimize our network um, based on our objective. Um, so you might think, oh, we're done. We have all three steps of uh, deep learning down. We've solved deep learning. Uh, not quite. There are still a lot of issues. Um, one of the biggest issues that we haven't covered is that uh, generalization uh, in that we want right now uh, the way we have it set up the neural network will just try to learn directly the mapping from the training set uh, the training set data to the training set labels but what we want is for it to perform well on a test set and for it to do that it needs to generalize well and avoid the problem of overfitting where it it learns this really complicated function that maps to the test set really well but then I mean the training set really well but then you give it a test set and it won't do that well so you want to find this balance between underfitting and overfitting. Um, and how do we actually do that? Well, that's through regularization. Um, so there are a few ways to regularize, regularize. You would have seen a lot of them in like 189 or a course like that uh, for sort of more shallow methods and maybe for neural networks as well. Um, but basically for neural networks, the their there's a big list of different ways to regularize. Here, I, I'm going to talk about these ones, but the list is longer than that. Um, the chapter 7 of the Deep Learning book has uh, more things I haven't covered here, as well as some of the ones I've covered. Um, so parameter penalties is, uh, you definitely would have seen this in 189, where you have some, you do things like uh, akin to ridge regression as for like L2 or lasso for L1. Um, and then data set augmentation is a bit, is, is sort of nuanced. It's hard to see why it's a regularization technique, but it is a regularization technique in that it uh, uh, prevents, uh, it helps, to, helps for generalization. Uh, and then ensemble methods is where you ensemble a bunch of different models, maybe a bunch of different neural networks in order to improve their overall generalization ability. Um, Dropout is a technique for neural networks that is actually a type of ensemble method, but it's a very efficient way of doing this ensembling. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, uh, adversarial training, where you're trying to train the neural network to not only do well on, this, on the inputs it's seen, but also do well if an adversary tries to prevent it from doing well. And so I'll talk about that at the end. Um, so just... Uh, quick run through of the basic like L2, L1 weight uh, penalties. So L2 is a L2 norm. So uh, you add this L2 norm penalty with a hyperparameter lambda on it. So where W is the weights of your neural network. So this basically penalizes having big weights to your neural network. And you can think of this as just like a sort of Lagrangian multiplier problem where you have constrained optimization. Um, so you're, it's not exactly like that because you have this, this hyperparameter here and you're just penalizing it. But if you were to think of it as constraining it to only this, uh, this sort of circle uh, where your weights have to be this small, then you can think of it as a Lagrangian multiplier problem where you're trying to find the minimization of this cost function with respect to this constraint. Um, the constraint loosens a little bit because it, it's not a strict circle. It's just you try to minimize that circle, but um, that's the general idea. And then there's L1 weight penalties where you use an L1 norm instead of an L2. Um, these uh, typically are used to, if you want to create some sort of like sparse representation or you want to do some sort of implicit feature uh, selection, uh, you can sort of see from this picture why it creates this sparsity and acts as a feature selector because, because of these sharp angles you tend to get uh, more sort of ones and zeros in your in your uh, weights than uh, the intermediate values, just because of the sort of shape of an L1 norm. So 
moving on to data set augmentation. So, so generally, if you have more data, you're going to generalize better to new data. In speaking in general, it's possible for that not to be the case. But uh, generally, if you have more data, you'll do better on new unseen data. Uh, so that's the idea behind data set augmentation. But oftentimes, you can't just get more new real data. So you generate new fake data instead. Um, uh, so there's various ways to do this. Um, some examples are if you have image classification, you could translate and rotate your images, uh, or you could crop your images, or you could add random noise to your images and, and then treat those as new examples for your training data. Um, this, this acts as sort of a regular regularizer in the sense that it helps you generalize better to new examples. And uh, moving on to ensembling methods, there, there's a huge range of ensembling methods, but the broad idea around <laughs> all of them is that we're trying to combine a bunch of different models to make one prediction, and then hopefully that prediction will generalize better than the prediction of any individual model in the ensemble. Um, so there's a few examples of ensembling methods, which I'll talk about, uh, bagging, model averaging, dropout, and boosting. I won't mention boosting, but boosting is pretty cool, so look that up if you're interested. Uh, on the right here, we have an example of model averaging, where we fit three different linear models to this data, and then average the three of them. Uh, so like starting from different random initializations, you run gradient descent for these linear models, and they give you different results, and then you average the three of them. The idea is that um, it will generalize better because of the fact that you're sort of covering, uh, like, you have more representative power because you have more models um, without having to have uh, more weights in each model, which would sort of lead to more overfitting. So to start with bagging, bagging is where you take, take your training set and you uh, sample from it with replacement. Uh, some number of times to create uh, like k different data sets based on your training data set. Um, this way the data sets are all, all these k data sets are uh, unique with incredibly high probability um, and then you train a model on each of these distinct data sets uh, and use these, yeah, question? Is this like a bootstrap? Yeah, yeah, exactly like that. Um, yeah, so you train a model on each of these k data sets. You saying so? Um, yeah, so you train a model on each of these k data sets, and uh, then you can use some method to determine how you decide based on the outputs of each of these models on the final prediction that you'll give. Like you could take a majority vote from the models or average across them or things like that. Um, more generally, uh, there's model averaging, which you don't, uh, you don't necessarily have different data sets. You could have different data sets, or you could have different model architectures, or you could have different loss functions for each model, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and then at the end, you just take the average across the outputs of these models. Um, I sort of explained a little bit before, so I'll move on just for time. Uh, so, one of, the, one of the last things I'll talk about is dropout, which is where you have uh, sort of, you randomly decide to drop neurons in your network during training. So this essentially creates uh, an ensemble of a bunch of different networks because each time you go through your training, your network architecture looks a little bit different because it randomly dropped different neurons. So this is a way of efficiently um, creating an ensemble of neural networks without having to train each neural network separately. Um, also, one thing to note is that during test time with dropout, you don't, um, you don't, actually, you don't drop out during test time. So during test time, the, the network architecture is uh, stable and set. Um, yeah, so final thing, uh, adversarial training. The idea here is that Neural networks are actually really susceptible to an adversary who wants to change their output with very minimal change to the input. Uh, as an example here, you can see this image. 
And then the prediction is basically a, a pedestrian uh, identifier. It's trying to identify these pedestrians in the image. So you can see this is the original neural net. This is the original image and the neural network's prediction for where the uh, pedestrians are in that image. And then you can see someone has added a very small amount of noise to this image in a very particular way. And you can see the image looks almost identical to a human eye, but the prediction of the neural network is starkly different. Um, so, I mean, this is a really salient example because you can imagine, like, if you're in a self-driving car and you get this sort of example, really bad things could happen. Um, so, uh, one way to, uh, so I guess first, uh, there, there are a few different, oh, sorry, yeah. The difference between these images. So, um, essentially, there are like different methods here for uh, generating these adversarial examples. Uh, depending on the different method, exactly what changes is different. But um, basically, they use the gradient of the output of the neural network to decide on some small, very small amount of noise to add to this original image at each pixel. So it changes each pixel by a small value. And then it moves the neural network uh, like towards the prediction that it wants it to go towards using these uh, different gradient-based methods. So it decides on how much to shift each, each pixel in a very specific way such that it alters uh, the output of the neural network. Yeah, so as I was saying, there's these uh, three different uh, methods, uh, main methods for doing these adversarial attacks. Uh, FGSM, JSMA, and Carlini. Carlini being state of the art. You have a question? Yeah, sure. So neural networks tend to. You made a really good image for this, but the the loss space of neural networks tends to be really jagged. Like if you look at, uh, like um, I can't remember exactly what's on the plot, but. It's a really jagged space where um, things can be, like, two uh, decision boundaries can be very close together, uh, like, for different classes. So uh, a very small change can sh put you over the edge of a decision boundary very easily. Um, just because of the nature of, like, these large uh, neural networks having, like, very, very complicated f functions, basically. Yes? How does this reduce, uh, or how does this, how is this a regularization? Okay, so, yeah, I was about to mention this. So this, these attacks are not a regularization technique, but what people do is something called adversarial training, where they generate a bunch of these attacks on their own things. So they attack their own neural networks, generate these attacks, put their attacks in the training set, and retrain the neural networks on these attacks and their original data. And then the neural networks do better on these sorts of attacks. Um, Th this is still a very active area of research because uh, currently uh, you can very easily uh, fool a neural network even if they did adversarial training um, just because if you know what sort of adversarial training they did then you can create uh, an attack method that will get around their training anyways. Um, and Don Song, a uh, professor here, does a lot of work in this area. Uh, she wrote a really good paper recently on this, if you're interested. Um, I think that's all I have. So if any general questions? Yeah, in the back. Could you say that again? Louder? Um, do you consider stochastic depth to be a factor to Stochastic depth? Uh, I'm not familiar with that term. Um, it's, it's really Yeah, I, I haven't read this paper, so I can comment. You have <laughs> Yeah, question? Um, I think there's like not much to struggle with in this class, just because like uh, the project is very. 